Hey y'all, and welcome to the live stream tonight. In 2010 and 2011, police found 11 bodies along an isolated stretch of beach highway near Gilgo Beach. Now, a Manhattan architect, Rex Hierman, has been charged with some of those murders, but not all of them. Tonight, we have a very special guest. For 10 years, attorney John Ray has represented the families of two of those victims, Jessica Taylor and Shannon Gilbert. Rex Hierman has not been charged with their murders. We're going to be asking him about whether the families believe Rex Hierman was involved, what they know about the case. Now, John Ray is an impressive attorney, an attorney's attorney, if you will. He's been practicing law for 39 years, and he says, and I'm condensing this, but he, on his website, he says, we rise to trials, we work day and night, we care about each client, we outwork our opponents, we do not give up. I love that. That is exactly my credo. I thought that was awesome. He also says audacity, more audacity, always audacity. And you can add tenacity to that because for 10 years, he has not given up in this case. He has an entire room of his office devoted to his investigation of the murders of Shannon Gilbert and Jessica Taylor. 33,000 hours at last count of work has been put into that. He knows the case better than anyone outside of law enforcement and maybe better than a lot of people within law enforcement. So it's an honor to have John tonight. John, welcome. Thank you very much. A nice, very kind introduction. I appreciate it. So um, before it's, we it's, get started. I just updated. I'm now 41 years in and oh, it's, it's, a, okay. it's a more than 12 years of investigation. But go ahead. So uh, as Marlon put in the chat one time, please be sure to leave your DNA on the like button and then hit the subscribe button for cross-referencing. So let's jump right in. And John, I want to ask you, more than 10 years of waiting and finally an arrest. I've seen you say that the families you represent are elated that Rhett T. has been arrested. But is there also a sense of disappointment for them that no one has been charged with murdering Jessica Taylor and Shannon Gilbert? Of course, there's uh, a real sense of disappointment for the families whose loved ones' murders have not been solved, and for the obvious, the self-evident reason. But uh, it's a another way of saying that is it's perhaps a bittersweet taste that they have because the, the man, one of them is caught. Maybe maybe he is the only one, but he's caught and. Uh, it looks like a pretty good case, all told, uh, against him. So, and for the other victims whose families are, uh, shall we say, uh, requited by that knowledge, uh, that their child's murder was found, for them, there's been a great deal of uh, sympathy from my clients, but um, now it's their turn and that might not be so easy. Do the families believe that Rhett T. Yerman was involved in the murders of Jessica and Shannon? Uh, it depends uh, with whom you speak. But as a general rule, I could say that the attitude is or, you know, the, the disposition maybe uh, collectively is let's wait and see because we don't have enough evidence one way or the other. Certainly. Uriman is a suspect in the other murders. And that's saying a lot because there were no suspects for years. Um, or they were very, you know, very light suspects that never turned out to be anything. So having a suspect's important, but he's only that. And you need evidence to connect him. And surmise, guessing, um, inference, right? Theory, theorizing. These are all valuable and important tools, every one of them. But they're tools, they're glue, they glue together evidence, but they're not evidence. And once you, once you cross over the realm of uh, evidence and you say, well, this is likely, therefore it is, it's got to be true that he did this or he didn't do that, th then you've, you, you, you've, you've failed, basically, because it's evidence, evidence, always evidence that's what you need and you need in to actually put together the dots in a theory so that you can finally come to a conclusion 
but we don't have enough evidence yet. Were you surprised they still have not charged T. Yerman with Maureen Brainerd Barnes? They announced immediately that he was the chief suspect in that murder. And I think a lot of people expected he might be charged at that most recent hearing, but he hasn't been. Were you surprised about that? I was not surprised. Uh, what I was is somewhat skeptical and worried. And that's because Maureen Brainerd Barnes is found in exactly the same circumstances as the other three. They're lay, laid adjoining one another, more or less equidistant, more or less one from the other, covered in a, um, a ducks hunting kind of burlap. Um, you know, and all, all of them perhaps killed in the same way. We're not sure the police never say, but um, they seem to be so similar in circumstance in every way that the fact that the that the DA cannot charge Herman for one of them tells you that they don't have enough evidence as to that one of them at this time. Maybe maybe they're they're just waiting to develop the evidence, but they they're not ready yet. They don't have it. If they don't have it for her, and they can't even charge uh, immediately as to her murder. What do you think they're going to have with respect to the others? Right, right. Good point. That that's it's a real problem. Not there. They didn't cause it. Uh, you know, it's a, it's a problem of of the case. Um, you know, DNA by itself is very valuable, but it's not necessarily dispositive of the case. In mm -hmm. circumstantial evidence, you need strong evidence. You need real evidence. You need evidence that connects those dots and glues them together. DNA is only part of that. And DNA can be attacked, as it has been in many courts. So it's not a solid slam dunk case against Rex at this stage. And there's no better proof of that than that they couldn't charge him with uh, the death of uh, Maureen, uh, Maureen Brainerd Barnes. Good point. So uh, for years, there's been speculation about whether there was a Long Island serial killer or Gilgo Beach serial killer, or whether there were several different people who in entirely separate incidents murdered various people and just happened to leave them in the same place, or whether there was one killer who had an assistant or other people working with him. Where do you fall on that? Now that we've got Rex Yerman having been arrested, where, where would you fall on that spectrum? Well, I, in this respect, I mean, as I just said, that the theory that Rex is responsible is a strong one for the, the, the deaths, that is, of others besides the four, the so-called Gilgo Four. Um, but, uh, you know, there's seven others in the, in the area. Uh, so he's one. There's the theory that there's more than one. So that's equally possible at this sta early stage and without any other evidence. And then there's, of course, the theory that there's several, not just more than one, but several killers uh, operating separately or operating together. I tend to not like the theory that there are several killers operating separately because of the remarkable similarities in the deaths. This is one huge graveyard of sex workers a baby that belonged to a sex worker and a cross-dressing uh, male. So that in itself is is, it, is a quite a, a telling fact, isn't it? <laughs> and right. on top of that, you know, you have the similarity in the and the methods of death. Several of them have been dismembered, and their heads and arms and hands and feet have been found in other places their trunks having been found in wooded areas out east in Suffolk County in Manorville or west in Suffolk in Nassau County in Hempstead Lake uh, State Park. So they're similar in, in age, in size, in shape, in type, in work, and uh, circumstance. And they're all sex workers, pretty much. And they're all found in a one big area stretching along Ocean Parkway uh, from Western Suffolk County to 
uh, basically to the center of Nassau County, to the south center of Nassau. So, you know, when you look at it that way, it seems to be one grand plan or scheme. But on the other hand, we don't have evidence yet to make that sh- certain. And then you have the peculiar case of Shannon Gilbert, who, unlike the others, called 911 and triggered a whole series of unexpected, unanticipated events, certainly unanticipated for her killer or killers. And so we have that. And, you know, is she connected to uh, Rex and, and any of the others? We're not sure. We don't have any evidence right now of, of any strength that she's connected to Rex. You know, there's some vague circumstantial evidence, but it's not real enough to matter. And, and we talked on the channel about the fact that the South Carolina warrant that went out to the brother to collect the Chevy Avalanche, that it referred to a conspiracy. What do you think law enforcement is referring to in that warrant when they talk about a conspiracy? I'm not quite sure. Um, the uh, I'm not even sure of the context of that. When, when you say the law enforcement itself refers to a conspiracy, the warrant said that the warrant talked about charges against T. Yerman and name first went it didn't name the person, but it said charges of first degree murder, second degree murder, solicitation of prostit- prostitution, and it included conspiracy of, of the offenses plural. Conspiracy could only mean that there's obviously that there's more than one individual involved, but right. they haven't named anybody. So it's like I said, it, you just can't. Uh, you can't make much of it yet. It's, it's, it's interesting because it suggests that the, the uh, authorities believe that there's more than one person involved. Right. You can't conspire with nobody, nor with <laughs> yourself. But the son reported that uh, right before he Yerman's arrest, you were tipped that an arrest was about to happen, but you were given two names, not just to Yerman's. Are you still expecting a second arrest? And do you know what would be causing the delay in that? Well, I was given a tip. I, the facts are that I was given a tip several days, just three three days or so before the arrest, that an arrest was about to be made. And the tip uh, source was a very strong, good one in a world where most of the tips we have in this case are useless. Uh, this one was an exception, and we knew it. I knew it. Um, so I expected that that arrest, but I did not expect anything about Rex. That we knew nothing about him. So that's how he the... Was a, went. He was an unknown to everyone at that stage outside law enforcement. He, he was an unknown except to those who are in, involved with him. Uh-huh. And, and, right. You know, the, I mean, you, you, you can't... Can, can you just look the other way, uh, as has been suggested by many, at the people associated with Rex, like his wife? Two of her hairs are found on two of the bodies, on the tape that wrapped up the bodies. You know, we've heard that the district attorney or announced, or it was a police commissioner, I forget which, I think it was a DA, um, announced that they're not suspects. And I'm just wondering why they're not suspects. Um, you know, that's an open question. They're right. suspects in my mind. Now, have, have the families you represent been concerned that members of law enforcement were either involved in the murders themselves or involved in covering up the murders? There was always speculation that certain police uh, officials were involved in the conspiracy uh, of murder. I doubt it. Uh, I see no strong evidence of that. There is evidence that there were police officials who were involved in um, failing and refusing to investigate and in narrowing the investigation significantly so that it wouldn't really produce uh, anything fruitful that happened extremely likely that that happened from the evidence we have but to go beyond that to the next level and say uh, you know where there's smoke this fire and they they must they must be involved in a conspiracy to murder it's, it's not always that where there's smoke this fire right there can be a lot of reasons for smoke 
So that's what happened here so far that we know. I, I'm not of that conspiratorial bent of thinking. And, you know, if you think about it, everything you do when you talk to somebody else and you plan something is inherently a conspiracy, isn't it? So, you know, to, you conspire with your husband to, or, or to go to the, the grocery store when you, you work it out. But when you t talk about criminal conspiracy, which is a certain type of conspiring together, you need very specific proofs and evidences. And that does not exist as to a willful conspiracy to kill anybody on the part of the police department. So you mentioned a minute ago about the hairs that were found on some of the bodies that Rats Heerman's been charged with murder on. Um, and they had some findings that would link them, not maybe directly, but roundabout to at least the, it could be Heerman, could be his wife. Was Were there any findings like that with Jessica or with Shannon? Were there DNA findings, hair, anything like that that, that, that could be used to catch their killers? Well, right now, we know that, uh, that the police have never announced any other DNA samples that they possess for any of the other, uh, of those who are, who were murdered, including Shannon. They just haven't announced it. The problem with what I just said is that that doesn't mean it, it, it does not exist in their hands because the police have, have traditionally, and in these cases specifically, refused to turn over vast quantities of evidence or reveal those quantities of evidence in any lawsuit or to the public or in any other way. As you speak now, you don't know how some of these other girls were killed. You know, you know they were dismembered, but that doesn't mean that's how they were killed. You don't know if they were tortured. You don't know by what means. You, you, you know, there's a, there's a plethora of things we don't know, but the police do. Because they say, well, traditionally, we don't release that. And I, my answer to that is, that's okay. I understand that. There are good reasons not to release information to the public, which then the murderer could use uh, to his own advantage. But when a case hasn't been solved for 12 years, a case of on this scale, for 12 years it took to finally nail this guy, and, there, and now we still have seven people that are, that are not really going to be accounted for, for, you know, for the murders, maybe they ought to change their tactics and use the public, which is a very wise body, mm -hmm especially in the age of computers uh, and use the public and use the sleuthers and the rest by releasing a, a quantity, a much greater quantity of information and maybe hold back the, you know, certain poignant things that they could use to catch the guy, you know, trick him and whatever, but let us have more information uh, is to my way of thinking, yes, a reversal of police tradition, but it's a different age we live in and, we can use that computer knowledge and all the people. I mean, there are people in, we're not talking about the people in Suffolk County. I'm talking about people in the world. I've been contacted over the years by people who are very knowledgeable of this case from New Zealand, South Africa. Um, you name it, name a country. And I'll tell you, yeah, we've had that contact. So some very bright people doing research on the computer. What's wrong with that? What's wrong with using that? And what's wrong with encouraging that? We need that. And y'all can't know, but right before we came on, John and I were talking about that. And I was saying that I think lawyers are kind of mired in their tradition of secrecy and that we keep everything close to the vest. You want a protective order. You don't want the public to know. And I think that lawyers are missing the boat, uh, both defense and prosecution in some of these cases. I think a lot of these cases are being handled in the media or could be handled or could be helped through the media. And I, by media, I mean social media, broadly, the input of society, the input of the internet. So I, I do think people are missing out. And, you know, th this has come at a high cost to you personally, John, because up until a week before Heerman's arrest, 
you were still getting some pretty disturbing phone calls, right? Can you tell us a little bit about that and about why you think they stopped when they did? What I read one place was that they stopped a week before his arrest and the other that they stopped after. I don't know which is correct. They stopped before his arrest. Mm -hmm. um, the, the more um, awful ones were the ones I mentioned uh, on the media. There are several of them, actually, but the two most egregiously awful were, um, I know that's a redundancy, sorry, um, were um, the call we received in early January of this year. You know, we had been receiving calls before that um, of threatening nature or intimidating, you know, that sort of thing or weird. Uh, phone calls steadily throughout this whole case. Excuse me. <clears throat> but the one that came in early January was transfixing because it was different than all the others for, for one thing. And it came at roughly 1.30 in the morning. Um, our 18-year-old daughter, high school senior, was flying out to San Diego California uh, to be trained by Olympic trainers in, in her sport, which is race walking. She's very good at it. It was the first time she ever left their home uh, alone and flew on a plane. So we were a little worried about her. We get this call at 1.30 in the morning and it's first this certain like pause, a hash sound pause. And then there's some strange music played. Uh, it's hard to tell if it was just music or what it was. It was bizarre. And then uh, a, a long, not that long, but a, uh, um, pl audio of one of the reporters on the Gilgo Beach Shannon Gilbert case reporting on the case back in, I, I would imagine, back in 2012-ish or in that, that time frame. And then when that ended, on came a, a very uh, foreboding voice of a man, uh, not a kid. And um, he said uh, something along the lines of, um, I see a girl or a woman, um, I see a girl dressed in blue and she's in California and he spoke slowly and very deliberately dragging out the words. And she's, uh, she's climbing out a window and she has her cell phone in her hand. So, you know, I, I didn't know what to think at first. I was frozen. And seconds later, her mother gets a call on, on her cell phone. And it's an identical call, word for word in every respect. So it was clear when we thought about it, that the second call was a tape of the first call. And it went on to two different phones. Both of them registered in my name, but belonging to her, um, within seconds of one another. Now, our daughter flew to California dressed in blue. She was in blue sweats when she left. And, uh, you know, a blue, a blue um, sort of a sweatshirt type thing with, you know, tie and, and, um, and blue uh, blue uh, sweats as well on her legs. So, you know, we didn't want to scare our daughter if this was, you know, just a prank, but it was bizarre. And so we called the FBI. They were concerned. They had one of their San Diego agents visit the dorm type place where she was staying and she was sleeping, by the way, right next to a window. And uh, they checked it out. Nobody was there. They called us back and said, there's nothing going on and there's not anything we can do right now. So we left it at that. Um, in March, we had a second, the second one of these egregious type calls. I mean, there were several. But I worked until late. I went home around nine o'clock, a little after from work. <coughs> and sat down for dinner at the kitchen counter. We were living in a house with big windows and surrounded on three and a half sides with, with forest and a hill going way up. Uh, 
86 feet up. So um, it's, you know, it's a lonely place. And uh, I get a call on my cell phone, roughly at maybe somewhere after nine. That's all I can remember exactly. But uh, while we're eating and the same pattern with the same noises and the same uh, playback of, of the Gilgo Beach reporting. And then the voice comes on. It was a male voice. And it says, I hope you're enjoying your dinner. Now, how many people are eating dinner at nine o'clock at night <laughs> in Long Island? Yeah. That's not right. many. So right. that kind of froze all of us. And then within seconds later, maybe maybe a minute later, I'm not even sure exactly, the phone rang again. And this time, the same pattern, but shorter. And a woman's voice. We th I originally thought it was a man's voice, but I, we taped it. We managed to get part of that taped. Mm -hmm. So we have the woman's voice on it. And you hear the woman saying, I hope you're enjoying your pizza. We were not eating pizza and we had not ordered pizza. And she clicks off. And within three to five seconds later, the doorbell rings and the front doorbell. And it's the Domino's man delivering three pizzas. So they were surveilling us. There's no question that for that t timing to work, we were being surveilled. Right. And uh, it, 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 of course, it paralyzed my my family. They didn't know what to do. They went down on the floor. Um, so I called the police. We made a report. And then we called Domino's. Spoke to the man who took the order. And he said it was a voice of a woman, not a child, a woman who ordered the pizza and there was a man in the background who was directing her what to put on the pizza, pineapple, ham, that kind of thing. And um, the, uh, the, I said, how did, they, how did they pay for it? He said, they didn't. What happened was they used my number, the, my, tele, my cell phone number, which matched up with the record Domino's had of my number, and they delivered it to the house, I guess, expecting to get paid at the end. So they didn't pay for it, so we couldn't trace it. But that happened. And of course, you know, what do you do? Then we had several calls at the office only when my whole family was at the office and after hours. Uh, so we're hoping that the authorities look into it. Yeah, definitely. You know, one of the comments I just saw go by from Wody Love was, can John make the tape public? Maybe someone can identify the voice. And if it's a tape belonging to you and, you know, it would not interfere, I'd be more than happy to put it on my channel. Sure. So that people can listen to it and see whether they recognize the voice or anything like that. So let me know well, if I can help. Well, in that way. Thank you. And that's a great thought and a great offer. But um, we listened to it several times and we're relatively convinced, not certain, but... <clears throat> that the voice itself was a tape recording of a woman. It wasn't the woman speaking at that point, which is how he, he, he or she did the call in January, uh, the same method. So they may have tape recorded a woman saying that, and it's not the woman who was making the order. There was clearly a woman who made the order according to the dominoes, but it may not have been her voice. So um, I have promised John, that I would keep things to 30 minutes. So I want to wrap it up with just a couple more questions. Sure. Are the families of Jessica and Shannon confident that law enforcement is still seriously searching for the person or the people who killed them? Well, that's a split question, or rather, I should say, there's a split answer to that question. And, and that's because I think that some of the people who are the family members are convinced that the police uh, will be doing a good job further on. There are others who are much more skeptical of that. Um, I'm somewhere in between that in that <coughs> the new district attorney, Ray Tierney, is a good man and he's a good, I, I know him since he was a young fellow in the DA's office years ago and when he was in the US attorney's office Later on, I worked with him on a pretty famous case where we together, uh, I wasn't, you know, I was a defense attorney, but I was helping a victim, uh, a little, little girl, a lawyer, corrupt lawyer stole $1.2 million from her. And Ray 
took my evidence and prosecuted the lawyer. So I, I know him up front and he's up close and he's a good he's a good man he, and he's he's respectable. He'll do the right thing, I think. I don't think he's going to be influenced by bad things. Rodney Harrison, who came in as a new police commissioner, likewise, I got to know him. He, one of the first things he did was to call me and said, let's try to do transparency together and let's, you know, work together. And it was because of Rodney and that meeting I had with him that the I was allowed to release the 911 tapes of uh, the Gilbert matter. So, you know, Rodney and Ray pulling together, put together the task force that broke this case open. So I have, you know, a reasonable faith in their work and their ability. Um, I'm hoping that since there are now all these other forces coming in, the state police, uh, the sheriff's department, uh, the DA's office working together with the police, which is unusual. Uh, the um, the other forces coming in will ev eventually really professionalize the approach, as you've seen has happened now, and and work as it should. So I'm optimistic about that. I encourage them to do that, but I also have a reserve, uh, not just from being a skeptical lawyer, but from long experience, uh, when I see that many, some of several of the same people in the case now were the same people who were in the case before. So I'm waiting to see. Would it be fair to say that right now there's nothing to make you think they're any closer to finding the person or people who killed Shannon and Jessica? Right now, I've heard nothing favorable about opening up the case of Shannon Gilbert. Uh, as to Jessica Taylor, they're still looking. That case is still open as far as the uh, authorities are concerned. What they're doing to advance that case is you know, not known one way or the other. I, I can only assume that, that, that they're acting in good faith and telling us the truth that they're pursuing these cases or those cases in a hard way they're not taking that stand on Shannon to their great detriment, but hopefully I can change that. Well, thank you, John, so right. much for being on tonight. I also want to thank all of the people who helped me with questions in response to the post I did on the community page. Uh, subscribe to the channel for more great interviews and content on the cases everybody's talking about. I'd appreciate it if you push the like button on your way out. And I will see you on Friday at 7 for our next video and probably before that with the YouTube premiere. If you can hang on for just a few seconds more, John. Okay.